Wake up, Detroit. I'm Joanne Watson, and this is your wake up call. When a brown girl child is born, the earth shifts. The sun is at half mask. The moon waits for her first cry. The ancestors set the table. The flowers turn red as blood. This is your land, continent daughter. With tree trunk legs and branches for arms, this is your soil. Black and fertile as your eyes facing an apartheid Jim Crow current past memory. Some of us begin the removal of shackles at birth. We grow into the armor of struggle quickly. We brew courage in our tea, blend bravery into our Sunday dinners. Joanne Watson, you understand nation building is not a part-time job. This dedicated life is sometimes lonely, a vulnerable choice, but it is the only way you know how to operate. You are wired for the movement in your black women bones, even when tired, still fighting, still organizing, still singing morning spirituals. You are born to lead, even in your own family, the eldest of 10 children born to Jefferson and Lestine. You made Damon, Nefertari, Stephen, Maya. Her children always knew she was larger than life. When you are a woman in the movement, you take the children with you on the journey. You bring the babies with you to your college classes. When you travel to Ghana for the first time, it will be with your daughters in tow. When you are a fearless, nationalist thinking mama, mothering never stops with your own babies. 30 God children and mentees across the globe. The daughter of a ministering mother is already ordained for good trouble. A seer, a prophetic young student preparing for her lifelong role as servant to her own community. When your purse was snatched in a Farmer Jack parking lot many years ago with your kids tickets to run DMC in the purse, you made sure they still got to that concert and even hosted Melly Mel and the Furious Five in your living room, cause queens make it look easy. When you were a single mom, people would tell you what you can't do. Instead, you moved to New York City with all four of your C's to do your necessary work with the YWCA, cause queens make it look easy. Ghana, Togo, South Africa, where is your heart, Mama Watson? Nurturing spirit, bacon melt in your mouth, homemade biscuits. How many hours do you sleep, Warrior Watson, with endless work ethic and blue collar blood racing through your veins? How do we say thank you for your work, your time, your heart? We know you will never really retire. There is a fire on the path to freedom. There is smoke, there is sacrifice. There are stories of justice, of women, of Tubman, Sojourner, of Angela, Asada, Coretta, and Merle, and Betty, and Queen Mother Moore. Some of us know we are ancient, that our marrow is laced with legacy, that we are here to bring light to our daughters. Sometimes it just takes one woman, a mother, a grandmother, a spitfire, a griot, a sister, the only woman to lead the NAACP's largest chapter. She, daughter of the movement of Rosa, of Irma, she was a birth that gave birth to possibility for other young activists like me, a true D woman, frontline Fatima, Nigerian blood, councilwoman, leader, truth teller, Joanne Watson, social worker, president of the anti-clan network, sister inspiration, dedicated to the protection of girls and the voices of women wrapped in West African beauty, regal and resilient. Wake up, Detroit. Wake up, South Africa. Wake up, Cuba. Wake up, small business owners. Wake up, White House. Wake up, reparations. Wake up, teachers. Wake up, women, wake up schools. Sleeping is not an option when the Honorable Joanne Watson is in the room. Wake up, Detroit. I'm Joanne Watson. This is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice. Hallelujah. And we're glad in it. I don't know about you, but I can't let one day go by without praising his name. We praise God for uh, one of uh, the best progressive attorneys in the universe, Jerry Goldberg Esquire, who is the uh, not only the, the world's great attorney, he's also an attorney who's been my counsel. I love to tell the story about Jerry Goldberg being <coughs> my uh, chaperone when I was called, called into a meeting with the uh, emergency manager, uh, Kevin, or who asked every council member to meet with him independently to talk about what needed to be done in the city. So I, I asked uh, uh, Council Goldberg to go with me and uh, the first thing that happened was the emergency manager secretary came out and said, oh, no, no, you're not allowed to have anyone. I said, then he won't have me. So I go in with Jerry Goldberg or I don't come. And uh, they had consultation, and they said, okay. I said, he's my counsel. So you, you, 
always said, nobody in elected position should be going into a meeting like this without counsel representation. He's my counsel. So he went and Jerry Goldberg, uh, I, I'll let him tell you what he said. Well, we just let, let, <laughs> let the emergency manager know where the, all the funds in Detroit have been going. And, of course, they've been going right into the coffers of the banks. That's right. Who foreclosed on 65,000 homes and put the city in bankruptcy through crooked interest rate swaps. And I just want to say what an honor it is to be councilwoman. <laughs> Joanne Watson's my councilwoman, will always be my <laughs> councilwoman, and, uh, and and continues to be my oh. councilwoman. And, and, and whenever Joanne wants me around, she's got me. She she needs no counsel, <laughs> but, but she just. But, uh, we, but we're we're comrades in arms, and we I, we I'm are. So, I love her so much, and I love Jerry Goldberg. And uh, you should have. I just wish we had. Uh, had a secret camera so that the world could see how he squirmed and was so uncomfortable. He got hit with one question after another by me and, and Jerry. Uh, what do you? Why are you trying to walk us into bankruptcy when the city is not bankrupt? How could we be bankrupt with a billion dollar asset called the Water Department? Uh, of course, that's why he was brought in by this uh, uh, crazy uh, corrupt governor who ought to be in jail for poisoning Flint. He he knew he was a bankruptcy attorney when he brought in the. Kevin Orr from Jones Day, and it was a, it was a set up as a bankruptcy from the beginning. All of it was conspired, and that's why we need to continue to fight. We need to continue to fight, and when we fight, we win. And there's a big uh, event coming up now, and I want to thank Jerry Goldberg for helping us understand what's coming up that we can plug into. Well, this weekend, this Saturday, we're having a national conference to defeat austerity, and all austerity means is exactly what emergency management is, is that when the banks come in and directly rule and take over government to rule it for their interest. You know, when the, when the emergency manager came in, the first thing we looked at the bill, and the emergency manager had the authority to bust any contract, to break union contracts, but the one thing he was there for was to guarantee the payment of debt service to the banks. That's right. And that was what was behind this whole effort. And, and we feel... And also to break the pensions, and of course, to remove health care, to break the unions, and, and to uh, make sure that the city would give away its most significant asset, the Water Department. No question about it. And, 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 and the conference we're having this weekend is because what we're seeing in Detroit with the Dugan administration, but beyond that is that after years of putting up a fight and, and without Joanne on the Councilwoman Watson on the council, we've seen a pattern in the city where Gilbert, who's received hundreds of millions in giveaways to the banks, that actually gets to keep all the in taxes from everything he owns. He, he keeps the sales lender. tax. He keeps the property tax gains. I mean, all this so-called development that we're seeing downtown has no benefit from the community because these the tax dollars don't even. And go mind back you, into the he's a man who contributes heavily to this uh, crazy president. He's yeah. a big contributor. And we feel that, and so many groups now under the pressure of. of just trying to provide anything for, for the people in our neighborhoods continue to be completely devastated. Every time you drive around Detroit, it doesn't look better. It looks worse, unfortunately. It looks like it's been hit by a bomb. You got it's it. like a war zone. And I was born in Detroit. It's a disgrace for a city with the history of Detroit. I know. I cry uh, to, every time I We go. used to have the largest number of black homeowners in the country. It was the base of the black middle class. It was the home of organized labor. It had so much that caused us to be an idyllic city, and it was deliberately targeted. It's been, it's been hit by uh, economic terrorism. That's exactly right. I mean, I can't say it any better. That's exactly what happened. And we believe this, this terrorism, it's a long-term process, but, but in, the, in the beginning, in the early 2000s, we saw a two-pronged attack. And, of course, part of it was primarily the banks coming in with predatory lending practices that were targeted against black people particularly. That's right. And, of course, in Detroit, which is, was a city with the highest home ownership, we had 65,000 mortgage foreclosures in four years' time from 2005 to 2009. Foreclosures, every one of them was based on a predatory loan. I, I That's was, right. I represent a lot of people in foreclosure. And we'd look at the loans, and they would get you know senior citizens to sign over their homes. So you, we'll give you, a, we'll repair your roof, just sign over your home. Don't yeah. worry about it. Within three years, they're making a payment that the banks knew they couldn't afford. Right. And then, and then when they got done driving 237,000 people in the city and putting there's the your city, population laws right there. And then putting the city into financial, obviously into a financial crunch. What happens then is they go into the city and put the same kind of loans on the city. Uh, with and now they say the homes are overassessed. Yeah, now, now they admit that they overassess 
that the tax bills people were receiving were, were fraudulent, were wrong, and they were refusing to pay back what, what is properly owed many thousands of people who got illegally put out of their homes. And in fact, the overassessment was part of the predatory lending. That's practices. exactly right. The overassessments hit their peak in 2008, and one of the prime people in overassessment is Dan Gilbert. Absolutely. In fact, he's been predatory. sued in state after state. He's been sued by the federal from, government. By the federal government on HUD homes, and in state after state for doing fraudulent, uh, uh, no paper appraisals and jacking up the assessments in these homes. And yet he's the one who's getting our tax dollars. And what we want, what this conference is about, is to say we want to go back with the people. Let's, let's look at the reality of what happened to our city and let's go and, and that if we're going to rebuild Detroit, this isn't going to be built based on giving tax breaks and tax captures to Gilbert and Illich. Illich, I just was reading, you know, they sold 39 parcels of property to Illich for one dollar around the, uh, to build that stadium. They still owe $180 million to the city for unpaid assessments with Joe Lewis Arena. No. You know, people, uh, it was brought up by Crystal Crittenden. That's one of the reasons she lost her uh, corporate, uh, that, that position as the, as the counsel for the city. Because she dared, had the courage to bring it up. And, of course, I had her back on council. Uh, no doubt. Uh, uh, in fact, I went, I left the council. I, I rarely left the 13th floor. I like to stay on the city council floor to protect the interests of the people. But when I found out what that Crystal Crittenden had learned, that the uh, by doing their homework in the law department, found out that the, the Illich company owed the city of Detroit $180 million <laughs> unpaid during the tenure of Joe Lewis Arena with, that they're now trying to tear down, help me somebody. <laughs> so every time they won a, a, a division championship, they should have paid uh, some kind of fee to the city. Every time they were on TV, some kind of, for every concession stand, something should have gone to the city. And it's not all that, that the company's fault because the city should have been collecting all along. No doubt so, you know, uh, uh, it failed to collect as it should have been collecting down through the years. But with this conference, this conference is exactly about it's putting a focus on what led to the destruction of our neighborhoods to say let's rebuild the fight to go after those who took from Detroit. That's right. The billionaires. Look at all the schools to closed. To These closed schools that have demoralized and decayed a lot of our neighborhoods. And, and, and the closed schools, the schools right now, school funding, funds that should be going to school funding from the property taxes of all this so-called redevelopment downtown, they go right into the coffers of Illich and Gilbert. They don't, people don't even get the benefit of that. One thing I think a lot about is, a, is what Councilwoman Watson raised a number of years ago was a Marshall Plan for Detroit. And that's what we need. And we say that we need a new Marshall Plan for Detroit, just as you raised, and that the funds for that Marshall Plan should come from the banks, from the big financial institutions that robbed our city, that, to, that owe us really billions of dollars. There was something like $4.3 billion was taken out of Detroit alone that's by right. the banks. More black wealth, black, 50% of black wealth was destroyed by the predatory lending practices of the banks. It was we deliberate. said, let's go after them to reef to fund a Marshall that's right. Plan and put it in the hands of that's the people right. of this community to rebuild us. And, that's and, right. And we see no other way forward. And that's what this conference is about. And the conference is going to link what's happening to Detroit to what's What's happening in cities across the country and country and, and all gentrification, the parts of the world. land banks. Uh, you know the land banks. I knew it was illegal when I kept my finger in the dike. Try it took me. I spent five years fighting land banks, and then some of my colleagues on the council got talked into supporting it. So it finally passed seven to two. Of course, I voted against it, spoke against it. Land trust is the way to go with land acquisition, not right. land bank. Everywhere there's been land banks across this country, gentrification follows. People of color lose their property, lose their homes, and the city's lost its tax base. Exactly right. And of course, where the funds, well, the main thing the land bank's been doing is tearing down homes right. using hardest hit funds. Which should be going to people hardest hit. And to keep them in their homes. Right. And those funds instead are diverted by the state That's to, right. uh, to keep you on. So the conference we're going to have is to talk about these issues, to re-examine the roots of our crisis, to talk about building a struggle, to take back our city from these financial institutions that destroyed it. And we're very excited. There are going to be people coming in from a number of cities Excellent. that are under similar attack, from Baltimore, New York. It's happening all over the country. All over Chicago. You know, the schools, they're shutting schools in the neighborhood where I grew up. I grew up in the south side of Chicago. They're shutting the schools in the south side 
and why. That's Let's right. Let's pay off the same kind of debts that Detroit was put into, which are That's right. interest rate swaps. We're going to have people that are going to go over. There's a group called uh, Refund America that are kind of advised us during the bankruptcy, taught us about how to look at those financial instru- instruments. A young African-American man, Maurice Drew, and he's going to do a workshop on understanding how the banks are destroying your community. We're even having a representative from Puerto Rico flying in for this conference. My, my, my. Former head of the Electrical Workers Union. Because Puerto Rico is like Detroit on steroids. Eight, it's now six months since the hurricanes, and parts of Puerto Rico still don't have electricity. That's exactly right. And the reason a is... A third of them still, third, don't, still don't have electricity. And the reason is just like what happened with our water department. All the funds that were supposed to maintain the electrical infrastructure in Puerto Rico were paid out in these crooked loans to the banks. The That's banks right. in a f- country of four million people put $72 billion in bad loans to the people, in debt service to the people. Every worker in Puerto Rico is paying $80,000 to the banks. And these are crooked deals. There was one deal where Wells Fargo had a $2 billion bond. By the time they kept renegotiating like they did in Detroit with the swaps, the people ended up paying $21 billion, 743% interest. And so, when you, and remember, there's a link between Detroit and Puerto Rico because this, the, the, the I, I believe, illegal legal and unconstitutional bankruptcy that took place in Detroit, which I went to court and testified against, told the Judge Rhodes it was illegal because that, that bankruptcy uh, filing never got approved by the city. Uh, Kevin Orr was not the city. He was an appointee of, of this racist governor who, who brought him in just for the bankruptcy. Never got approved by the council or the mayor, never even seen by us, and got filed with the federal court. So I, I said that in the court, and he knew as soon as the bankruptcy uh, fraud was completed, he stepped down from the federal bench, went to work for Jones Day, Kevin Orr's company, and went to, flew to Puerto Rico to address bankruptcy proceedings for Puerto Rico. It's a setup. All of it was conspired. You got, and they called. And the, then he became an appointee, appointee of this governor as an emergency manager for the Detroit Public Schools. Exactly right. And, and, and in Puerto Rico, they say Puerto Rico, they're trying to impose the Detroit model on Puerto Rico. And that's why it's so important. And we feel there's a direct link between the people of Detroit, the that's people right. of Puerto Rico. That's right. And really, this is a worldwide pattern Absolutely. of austerity. And we're going to have a speaker from Venezuela. And we're really excited. We think it's time to bring back the fight. Against. Let's that's right. That's fight. right. And we, that's right. We're that's tired right. of people sitting down, collaborating with Gilbert, getting a few dollars to save uh, uh, two, two homes when he's destroying thousands. And we my, want my, the people my. to rise up again. That's what this conference is about. It's, gonna, it's a chance to be educated, but it's also a call to action. That's right. It's going to be this Saturday. Uh, we're having breakfast at 9 a.m. The conference starts at 10. It's going to go from 10 to 5 at St. Jo- uh, St. Matthew's St. Joseph Church at 8850 Woodward. We're not at, we're asking people for donations, but no one will be turned away. We're going to serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner there. And we really want to have a session. And we think it's going to be a terrific time to bring people back. Of course, we're going to lose use this conference to mobilize for the poor people. That's right. Campaign, That's right. For May Day, for building actions to challenge the continued tax foreclosures. That's right. But also to re-educate ourselves. And I, and I really think one of the core things we want to come out of it is is to re redevelop the demand that the Councilwoman Watson raised that we need a Marshall Plan. We need to rebuild our city. The banks owe the city of Detroit yeah, reparations. They do. Yes, they reparations do. Reparations. And, and let's and those reparations need to go to the people of Detroit. That's community. right. We don't need the bankers and developers telling us how to rebuild our city. That's right. We have plenty of people who know how to rebuild our city. We know what we need, and we and, and the funds to do it. You are better owed say us, it. That's right. Us. That's you right. Know, we don't. Owe and them they know they, they owe. Us. Look at Betsy Voss, uh, the alleged Secretary of Education, who's busy trying to uh, demolish public schools around the country and especially in Detroit. So are we going to sit back and let it happen or are we going to fight? Exactly right and too much. I mean we, you know, we went through a tough struggle in Detroit. I mean, I was very proud. My proudest day as a lawyer was intervening in the bankruptcy my, my, to my. challenge Rhodes and to challenge Orr and to challenge Jamal. Jerry was to be, and, and there was no one who took the principled role he did, and he did not do it for money. Not a second. No. He did it out of uh, his commitment and, 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 and his pride in the, in the right of the rule of law to be followed with respect to the city of Detroit. So we owe a great debt to Jerry Goldberg because yeah. he stood up where many other attorneys were turning a deaf ear, wow. a blind eye. He stood tall in the courtroom and filed cases, and the most significant challenges to the bankruptcy were filed by Attorney Jerry Goldberg. Yeah. You need to know that. 
Yeah, my proudest day as a lawyer was when we had the trial on the interest rate swaps. That's right. And we actually forced Rhodes to renegotiate them on two times. That's right. To lower them down from two hundred fifty million to eighty nine million. That's right. And, and of course, at that point, I said they we don't owe a dime. They owe us. That's because right. Because they were taking fifty million extra out of the city. That's right. And the one who, who educated me, who provided me with support, was of course Councilwoman Watson. And it was before that because they laid the basis for the bankruptcy over a period of years. By Those swap deals. We knew they were illegal when it happened, and when uh, uh, several council members who were conscious at that time refused to vote on it, they actually put our faces on 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 on, on national news and said we were derelict for not voting. No question, and this and people should not. Sometimes people feel well. You know, they try to make it sound like it was just in Detroit that people got sw But they were swindled all over the country. Yep. They were swindled all over the world because that's what the banks do. They're, they're, they're really, there's a great work. And when I started doing anti-foreclosure work, I read the Senate Select Committee report on Wall Street and the financial crisis. And it reads like the Godfather. Yeah. And it shows how this was a plan. And what was behind it is they made big profits. Sure they you did. Know, when they did a subprime loan, they, they would mortgage, they would bundle them up, sell them as securities. And they sold them for eight times the profit as the fixed loans that people had been in for years. And that's why they did it. And they knew they were going to fail. Sure. The ratings agency who came to Detroit, a Moody's who got there at the table and told people to take these swaps, were the same people telling everyone that these fraudulent loans were triple A bonds. Right. You know, it, it, it's a crooked And they even gave uh, Mayor Kilpatrick an award, flew right. into New flew York, into Wall Street. gave him a great big award for <laughs> helping to uh, push through the swap deals that were illegal. <laughs> right. They had no problem with Mayor Kilpatrick uh, at that at that moment, and, that, and and and, but this was all over, and we, we and we really feel so strong. And of course, part of it was they took our services. I mean, that's they right. Took head start from the people. The only one who spoke out in council was Councilman Watson. They they withheld emergency needs money. That's for, right. For a year and a half, they withheld those funds. That's the right. Funds to keep people in their homes, to pay heating bills, were withheld. That's and, right. And the only one, and I went to court, and the city fought me on it. They sure and did. The only one who, who raised. They closed the, the health department. Who closes the health department? <laughs> I swear. The first health department in the state of Michigan certified health service closed because they could. That's right. No respect. They closed the, the, the agency, the department in the city that was passing out commodity, food, and, and the housing, exactly. and clothes, poor people services. In, eliminated. They struck. They they withheld seven hundred million dollars in revenue sharing. From That's the state exactly right. From a period of two thousand four to two thousand twelve, seven hundred million. That was more. Seven hundred thirty one million. Exactly right. And, uh, and, and, and this is according to the Michigan Municipal League. This is right. not filed by uh, some uh, red, black, and green group. It was the Michigan Municipal right. League, which is the the local equivalent of the National League of Cities, which proved that. Although I spent several years talking about the twenty-four million unpaid from the deal worked out between Engler and Archer, the actual the aggregate number was seven hundred thirty-one million dollars. The state of Michigan owes the city of Detroit right now, today, on unpaid revenue sharing. And you know the Dugan administration is so rotten and so corrupt that there's actually a lawsuit that's been done by the Sugar Law Center to recover the stolen revenue sharing, and you know, the city of Detroit refuses to join it. We were the biggest victims of the stolen Absolutely. revenue sharing, but the Dugan administration, they approached them, were stunned that they wouldn't even join this this case, which could bring $730 million You know, back. some of us ought to join it. Well, we, we should. We that, should. Why don't we intervene in that? Because we're city residents. That's a great that, idea. Yeah, we should join it. If the, the, the city proper doesn't have enough sense to join a suit to demand our money back from the state of Michigan, uh, citizens who are who have a stake ought to do that. Well, let's look into that. That's right. a great idea because because this is. It, but it's typical of what really we see has happened in Detroit. You know, who would people, give away seven hundred thirty-one million dollars that the state owes? I mean, who in their right mind would not reclaim money that is due to the city? Well, that's exactly what we want to do at this conference this Saturday: is re-examine the roots of the crisis in Detroit, show that what's happened in Detroit is well, Detroit has been the center of what we call austerity, with these attacks by the 
corporations and the banks on cities in, in the U.S. It's really a national pattern, in that, and it's an international pattern. Uh, I was reading in Tunisia, where Occupy began, where the demonstration began. Right now, 74% of their budget goes to pay off debt service. Ma, ma, ma. How can you develop a country? You can't. I mean, the water shut off. People, you know, talk. Uh, and, and it's, Illegal. And, and, but one aspect of the water that no one talks about is that from 2011 and 2012, the water department floated bonds. And those bonds, $1.1 billion in bonds, they were supposed to repair the infrastructure. And think about this. Every time a water main breaks or every time a resident gets shut off for a $150 bill, $537 million of that $1.1 billion went to pay off interest rate termination fees on swaps. That's exactly bank. right. So Chase, Goldman Sachs, City, they're the ones behind the water shutoffs That's right. in Detroit. That's so, right. So we, we really want to have the and, and the water shutoffs are illegal because the former president, God rest her soul, Marianne Mahaffey, and I spent years passing a water affordability right. plan for the city of Detroit. It took us years to do that because we had to fight some people on the council. And now they, you and have to find, fight them again. They had to, <laughs> so we had, and we had to find the money because they said the rate payers uh, couldn't, couldn't subsidize somebody else's uh, water bill just because they were poverty stricken. And then Victor Mercado slipped and said at a, at a, at a public hearing that there was $5 million set aside delinquent fees and late fees and that could be used so we leaped on that and that's how it uh, finally got implemented but they only implemented it for two and a half years right. then they stopped it that's right the, the epa says that the regulation for water bills that no one should pay more than two to two and a half percent of their income for that's a right. water bill and detroit people are paying 10 to 15 percent for water bills and, and we, we own the water have. department we own it Right. No, no, it's not the federal water. It's not the state. The city of Detroit residents paid for it by bond. Mm -hmm. It is, and that there should be no dismissal of uh, utilities without a public vote. There's been no public vote to exactly. give away, take away, lease away the water department or public lighting for that matter. Exactly There's so right. much illegality has gone on, and that's why you need conferences like this as an organizing base to help people get educated to help them get organized, to help us remember who we are. Exactly right. And, and to say we're not, we're not going to just acclimate to what big business and the rich and the politicians in their pocket will, will tell us to do. We're going to re-educate ourselves so we can fight on the terms that we need to fight. And we believe, of course, that housing should be a human right, health care, education, everything should be a human right. That's right. And these rights have been taken away from the people. So we still have And assets like Belle Isle. Exactly. I'll have you know when Snyder first got elected, one of his, uh, Rich Baird and uh, one of his other uh, uh, cronies started walking the floor of City Hall in Detroit. He had not been in office 90 days asking questions about Bell Isle. No doubt. And what they did, and of course what they did is they virtually they gutted the recreation department. I remember going to a rally on Belle Isle before they, they sold it off, and they were down to four workers right. maintaining the whole island. Right. So what they did, and that's what they did with so much. They laid the basis for emergency management by basically gutting services. That's right. Uh, time and time again. And unfortunately, about the only voice that in council that stood up to every one of those cuts during that time uh, uh, was Councilwoman Watson. And you were. You were the voice that stood up. And our council went along with it. Look, Gary Brown went along with it. Where is he now? He runs the water department fighting against affordability. Plan. We showed uh, during the, during the uh, bankruptcy in one of the panels we're going to have workshops in this we're, is going to be on the water shutoffs. Good. And Alice Jennings is going to lead it. Excellent. The, uh, the such a fine woman, against, such a great attorney. And, and along with Nicole Hill and some of the people yes. who were, at that time, they were victims of shutoffs and plaintiffs. And, and we're so grateful activists. to We the People and Monica Lewis Patrick and uh, Deborah Taylor and all of them. Sister Ebony and uh, all of those who have been fighting to make sure that people whose water has been illegally turned off have access to water, that they're distributing water in Detroit and Flint and uh, distributing respect and dignity to our people who have a right to be treated like they're human beings. No doubt about it. I mean, one thing in Detroit, we have a wonderful core of activists that, are, that continue to fight every day and that work together 
and we're going to continue to work together. And, and we have every confidence that the struggle, Detroit, you know, Detroit is, is, is you know, much better than me, is it was the center for the Black Liberation Movement. That's right. was the center for the workers' movement, and we should be the center of the movement to take back our city That's right. from the banks and corporations That's that right. are ruining them. You know, I, I, when I meet with young people, a lot of young activists come in, and the, and, and the narrative they're given is, well, Detroit was just on a pattern of steady decay over the last 50 years, and we say, no, that's not true. That There, there are periods when we saw distinct efforts to, that's to right. destroy the economy. First, of course, was when Chrysler shut almost all the auto plants in Detroit in the late 70s after Mayor Young got elected mayor and, and when they withheld all the funds from Detroit for a, almost boycotted Detroit. That's and right. And we still survive. That's right. In Detroit in, in 2000, in the early 2000s. Well, Mayor yeah. Young was the best manager of a major city in this country, in the history of the United States of America. And our neighborhoods didn't look like what they are now. That's right. I mean, that's what I tell all these young people. If you looked in the early 2000s, well, the one thing Detroit always had is we had wonderful neighborhoods. That's right. Homes. It was a one city where working people and especially people African Americans own their own homes. That's right. And and and, and, and it was the, the home of the black middle class. That's right. And this decay that we see now, what we see now, it's conspired. Didn't just happen. It was a conspiracy. Targeted. It was a targeted effort by the banks that literally, literally we. And it's designed just, to make you hate yourself. Exactly. Well, to, that's to, what they did. To I not mean. trust your leadership, so the, we have to overcome and push back on any notion. That uh, we did it to ourselves. No, we did. They did it. Exactly. I mean, when people would come into me facing a foreclosure, the first thing I would do to them, they, I have people would come into my office and be almost in tears, be shaking. I'd say, "Wait a second, you're the victim in That's this. That's right. You're not. You didn't do anything. That's wrong. right. And in a way, you got to get past that. I mean, there's a group that did anti foreclosure work. They did it in the basis of grief counseling. That's so right. First you and people... Vanessa Fluker have been uh, just tremendous in standing up for citizens who often had nobody else to stand with them during a time of foreclosure crisis. So we salute you. Well, Vanessa is still, still in court every day. Uh, bless her you. heart. She's in court every bless day. Bless her she heart. She goes around with a walker these days. <laughs> she, you know, she was very sick a year or two ago, but she's in court fighting every day. But, and but, Marilyn Mullane and Ted and, and so many others have stood with people who have really put their lives and their careers on the line just to help our people hold it together. And part of what, of course, is just what you said it so well is that the mentality that's so rampant, not just in Detroit but everywhere, is they want to atomize people and, and they blame the poor for being poor. They blame, blame the victim. They blame workers for losing their jobs when in fact this is a system. And, and, and we are part of a, a class, a working class that, of all nationalities. And we have a right. And we built everything. We built everything to this day. And we have a right. Look at all this new technology that's throwing people out of work. You know, in the like, late 40s, the UAW is talking about a 30-hour work week. That's what right. happened to that? Right. You know, you that, know before I was elected, there was a, a bill passed. There was a referendum passed by citizens in Detroit that uh, seven years before I was elected that said privatized a contract should not displace okay. union workers. Exactly right. And it got the citizens passed it, and it got shuttled off to the law department for study, never to be seen again. So I came on council and demanded that it be put back on the table, and that the that the city follow through on what the citizens voted on. You can't get higher than that. No doubt. So it demand and and had to sponsor the privatization ordinance. And technically, I shouldn't have even had to sponsor it because the citizens ordered it. Seven years before I was elected. Exactly, it was part of the it's part of the charter, but of course, getting it enforced or, has been very difficult. I can tell you firsthand, and I don't know how they get. And then of course, what they used the bankruptcy was to get through all that. What the bankruptcy did was supersede all any law that was that's on right. the books that was beneficial. That's how they got. That's the, as you said, the bankruptcy was primarily because that was their method of going after the pensions. That's right. They had a constitutional that's guarantee right. for pensions, and in fact, seventy-eight percent of the so-called savings to Detroit came off the backs of the pension. Absolutely, None absolutely. None of it came off the banks and, and the, it came off the pension. And the infrastructure of the city has been forever changed because they forced people who were civil servants to reapply for their own jobs. That's exactly And right. the citizens don't even know that by and large. We if I had uh, uh, employees of the city, I had left, I had retired from the council and I would be, I was busy teaching at a college and doing my uh, post-council business and had to get so many calls from city employees who said that something's going on, I have to read, they're making me reapply for my job in the planning department, and I'm a civil servant. 
Nobody is helping me. Not the mayor's office, not city council. And I, you know, I'd give them some instruction, but it's, it's just a shame when the, the law has been violated over and over again. We were the first city to pass a living wage. Remember, we had a referendum. Absolutely. And if that living wage was in effect today, it would mean that anyone working on a city job or a contract, anyone or any corporation that gets tax benefits from the city, which really is every corporation in the right. city, would be guaranteed at least $15, $16 an hour. Well, of course, the state passed, there was a court decision overturning it. Uh, the, the, suddenly the bill gets removed, and now the state passes a law making it illegal for a city to pass a living wage. In fact, there's a referendum, and one of the things that's going to be raised at this conference is there's a rec referendum by the restaurant Opportunity Center to put a living wage on the ballot in, That's in right. Michigan, and it's a and it's and what's critical about it. I was at a conference this weekend where they were talking about it. Is you know, right now a, a tipped worker, a, re, a waitress, or a, a server who mostly are women, they can be paid as low as about two dollars an hour. That's right. There's no and, and 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 the Trump administration now wants to capture their tips. So so the it's just it's a wholesale attack on working people and That's poor right. people and especially of course people of color in this country women. and we got to and women That's and, we, right. and it's time people are starting to fight back there's a lot of young activists who are coming in that's one thing I'm so hardened by the young people a lot of young people oh, are coming in but we got to educate them yeah. because they don't they don't come out of the tradition of struggle that a lot of us older that's activists true. seasoned activists we saw the civil rights movement we 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 came up during the years of the black liberation struggle that's right. really the world struggle against imperialism or africa and Latin American That's people right. are rising up. We got to re-educate them at what the roots of the struggle are. So when you fight, you're fighting a conscious fight That's against right. the enemy. So we can take back what's on. We got to take back, and we're going to show up on Saturday. I hope so. I hope people come out. I think it, you know, people are going to find it fascinating. Give, give them the location again, again the, and the time. This Saturday, the conference, we're going to have breakfast from 9 to 10. The conference begins at 10 o'clock at St. Saint, uh, Saint Joseph St. Matthew's Church or St. Matthew St. Joseph's St. Matthew St. Joseph on Woodward. Computer, on Woodward at 8850 Woodward. Near Holbrook. Uh, near Holbrook. There's no charge for it. Uh, we're asking for donations. We're going to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner there. We have cultural events there. But most important, we're going to have people from all over the country addressing these issues, having workshops to educate people Organized. about the role of the banks, educate people to talk about the water shutouts, talk about the housing crisis, and then plan a strategy to move forward from, from, the, from with that knowledge into the streets and into the struggle. I think it's going to be a, a very good conference. It's not run by a bunch of academics. It's run by working people. Uh, the speakers will be people who are in the struggle themselves no, from no, no. the community. And we really hope people come out. I think it's a, a unique opportunity in Detroit. Sometimes we, you know, it's interesting. The idea for this conference was raised in Moratorium Now Coalition by one of the retirees who's been working with us since the bankruptcy. And she was the one, Yvonne Jones, who's a dynamic uh, woman who's really become a revolutionary uh, after uh, turned her own experience sure. into revolutionary conscience. She raised, look it, we got to take a minute to go back with people. That's right. Go to the roots because we can't just run around f from issue to issue. No, because the it, issues are at tied its base, together. what they did to defraud the pensioners, the retirees, illegal, unconstitutional, outrageous. Exactly right. It's an attack on elders, which is ungodly. Exactly right. And should not should not be accepted. So we we are so happy that this conference is happening, and we urge our community to show up. We want to extend a special good well wish to our brother H.T. Henry Tyler, whom we love and respect. He's vice president of Watkins Broadcasting, and we know that healing is on the way. We ask for the presence and the power of the Most High to infuse our brother Henry Tyler, whom we love and respect. We thank God for our, our, our leader, R.J. Watkins. He's a Watkins at Watkins Broadcasting. We're so grateful for Sean Watkins doing the great engineering and camera work and uh, now filling in for HT, we thank God for all those who are assisting and enabling and fortifying this magnificent broadcasting station in the heart of Highland Park and Detroit. We thank you for being a part of our program today. We're very grateful to Jerry Goldberg, Esquire, and we give God all the praise. Only God is worthy to be praised. Wake up, Detroit. <laughs>